Thanks, Rich. I appreciate it. All right, for everybody online, welcome. Whether you're a previous Layer A student, specifically one of my students, or brand new, and you because you heard of the author's webinar somehow, uh, welcome. And it's uh, now I've got a lot to live up to because Rich made it sounds like I'm going to be organized and and detailed about this. So I've got uh, the content I think is going to fit in today's schedule. And if I come up a little short, I got some bonus content. The odds that I come up short is probably a little bit thin. I'm going to do some whiteboarding. Videos will be recorded. Feel free to grab screen screenshots. And uh, we'll try to follow up with questions when they come uh, available when relevant. So first off, this, yes, is a kind of a, an updated version of a webinar we first started in 2019. That was one of, hey, what types of Nutanix concepts help out with Citrix? This one's trying to go in. Uh, there's a little overlap between that webinar. So if you don't know where it is, I'll show you where to find it at the end. No spoilers at this point. I want to go take this a little bit of a different direction, but we've got a lot of customers and students who are going to be Nutanix admins. They're saying, okay, what are we doing with our VDI solution, the Citrix thing, and how do what do I need to know about it to be an effective Nutanix admin on behalf of the Citrix environment? And so you may be new to all things CVAD, and again, the terminology, such as virtual apps and desktops, where are these components, what do we need to do to make this happen? What the heck is MCS or PVS? You know, we need to kind of explain a little bit. Two, we've got a lot of Citrix admins that deal with the product line since the early days of Zen Desktop to Citrix virtual apps and desktops, the current terminology and saying, I've been working with our traditional hypervisor. Someone somewhere decided that we're moving to a Nutanix solution. Now what? So this is the uh, someone got their chocolate and my peanut butter and I've got my peanut butter and someone else's chocolate course. I need to kind of meet in the middle between Nutanix stuff and CVAD stuff and what, depending on what your job role is, new to everything or one side of the fence or the other, we're going to help you meet in the middle to see some details. Now the challenge is, I know an awful lot about Citrix virtual apps and desktops from soup to nuts to implementation to design. So to me to stop talking about something is kind of difficult. Uh, on the Nutanix side, I need to cover enough of some fairly complicated topics just to give the CVAD admins a taste of what makes us different than what they're used to. So we can again, see those features. So if you're used to one side of the fence and you say, she kind of glossed over that topic there, yeah, what is the bare minimum I have to cover? But let's get you guys started with this. So that's the intro. Uh, we got about 40 people online. This is excellent. Welcome. So here we go. All right. First part about this, basically, there's just three simple parts to this discussion. I'll have some whiteboards. Not going to PowerPoint you to death, though I can. Uh, we're going to go over some key Nutanix cluster concepts. What are some things about Nutanix and some terminology so you know what we're talking about. And lay down the foundation of what makes the Nutanix solution different than our traditional hypervisors and centralized storage. The second part is introduce the Citrix side of the equation, the CVAD concepts, and some key architectures so we understand the space that we're playing in, uh, where these two meet. Uh, we're then going to talk about specifically the components that Nutanix provides to facilitate CVAD integration with Nutanix. These are our hypervisor connectors. We'll do some details on that, what components need these and why, and when do you not need them. And at the end, we're going to intro MCS and PVS in a little bit more detail. These are our two provisioning technologies. A lot of us these days, thanks to a little something called the pandemic, are probably doing way more VDI delivery than you probably thought you were going to do when 2020 was starting up. In the industry as a whole, VDI has kind of this emphasis on maybe a desktop workstation OS-based delivery, whereas from Citrix, we kind of do everything. It can be server or multi-user based. It can be desktop based. We're going to love this together, but we typically take advantage of provisioning technologies to help us start with one base, rapidly produce a whole lot of these things. These are usually virtual machines on a hypervisor, hence where the intersection is. And so we'll take a quick look at the MCS and PVS technologies, where they're similar, where are they different, and how do these play on top of the Nutanix solution? Where does Nutanix provide benefits? Where are there some features that we need to tweak a little differently? And some optimization that we can use. Now, some of that lecture was in the 2019 webinar, and if I don't get to all those points, I'll be sure you can supplement it. But that's where we're going to start off. So the overall objectives here, if you're a CVAD admin, what do you need to know about Nutanix and some terminology to get started? If you're a Nutanix admin, new to all things CVAD, uh, what do you need to know? All right, here we go. So first 
apart these key concepts. What is a cluster? What is this thing called distributed storage fabric? And oh, some Nutanix terminology, AOS and AHV. Now, for those of you that are Nutanix admins, we're not gonna cover all of that, just the highlights. And then we'll come in and do a similar intro to CVAD. This will lay the foundation for everything else. Try to keep it as efficient as possible. Um, so don't get too overwhelmed. We'll, we'll stay on the easy side of this. All right, here we go. Whiteboards. All right. Anyone who's been in my classes know I like my drawing utilities, so welcome. Okay, so one of the things that we're dealing with from a virtualization standpoint in general is that traditionally we get hardware of a certain configuration, a certain amount of resources, CPU, memory, networking, storage. Almost any major hypervisor has a way to allocate a subset of those resources to a guest operating system in what we hope is an efficient way. And therefore we can create one or many virtual machines. That who's not virtualizing these days, regardless of whether this is static infrastructure, database servers, stuff in service of VDIs, virtualization is virtualization, and we're going to deliver these results. So each of these resources can allocate certain CPU memory networking storage. Now, each of our hypervisors have a, a couple, uh, you know, common features and feature sets we can almost generally assume what's there. But in a traditional hypervisor, you typically plan out your hardware and the hypervisor capacity as one thing. We usually depend on centralized storage to hold the disks to ensure that any data that we require is accessible to every hypervisor host within the cluster. Now, as long as we make that data available across hosts, then if something comes up and we have a VM that we need to move to another host or in the event of physical hardware failure and we're doing some sort of VM recovery, a lot of our standard assumed hypervisor features of live migration and VMHA are kind of predicated on the idea is I can virtualize an operating system, grant it CPU memory networking on any host in this common cluster, as long as I can make that disk accessible to it. Okay. So with centralized storage, we throw all the disk onto a central tier that all the hosts have equal access to. And that usually facilitates a lot of our hypervisor considerations. Now, these days, virtualization is king. We're doing a lot. We're doing more of it than ever before. When we start talking specifically about VDI, you're starting to talk about hundreds, if not thousands of entities that need to be deployed. So the biggest challenge we have with centralized storage is that now you got a hypervisor design, you got a storage design, you got a storage network, connectivity between the nodes and the storage. And from a storage design standpoint, we got to think not just about the space we need to consume, the capacity. We got to think about, well, how many total things can read or write against that centralized storage at one point in time? What are my IOPS for performance? At what point do I have bottlenecks? At what point in order to scale my environment to do the delivery that we require, do I need to distribute the workload across more than one storage controller, disk arrays, SANS, NAS, think about RAID and data redundancy. So we've got a whole set of considerations we have to deal with. Now, virtualization has really been taking off since 2005, early days of ESX and all the things that have come since then. But this is like a design bottleneck and usually what we're using VDI deliveries for just compounds those problems, amplifies them quite quickly. So what is the new chance solution gonna do differently in this. So a couple of terminologies. Within Nutanix, we have this idea of a node. It is still a compute resource with certain uh, details on it. Some other notes we may not get to, they're just there in case I need them. And the overall idea is we still have hardware of a certain config. Now Nutanix is going to be relatively hardware agnostic. There's a range of hardware models and vendors that they can run on. Not completely anything you want, but a range. It's not just locked in. Two, the node itself is going to provide that compute layer. It's also going to consist of disks. Hey, we have local disks. Let's use them. We're going to try to use the disk now as part of a distributed local storage, what Nutanix terms a distributed storage fabric. And hey, that's the spoiler. It's already up. Uh, make sure data that we write has the performance that local storage gives us without the complexity of centralized storage, but without losing any of the flexibility of the centralized storage. I don't want to give up features or create single points of failure or this whole thing isn't going to work. So we start with the hardware, which is now virtualization capacity and storage. 
we use the hypervisor is still going to do our virtualization. Let's divide up those resources, present it to one or more guest operating systems in a virtual fashion, give them a subset of those resources. The difference is the hypervisor isn't the sole operator's box. What we also have is something called a controller VM, which is running AOS, Acropolis operating system. Now, when we say the phrase Nutanix cluster, especially as an outsider not paying attention, you, you may use the phrase Nutanix cluster to mean two very distinct things, and it can be a little confusing what we're referring to. The Nutanix cluster is really the operations of the cluster as a whole, cluster config, cluster management across these physical units, plus management of this thing that we call the distributed storage fabric. I'm going to come back to it in a second. A group of nodes all participating in a single configuration space management unit, a cluster, is going to be controlled by a group of CVMs. Okay, this is our AOS, this is our distributed storage fabric. We'll come back to that in a second. All right, so the idea, we're going to have the hypervisors on the bare metal box. Its job is to do virtualization. Let's present a subset of those physical resources to guest VMs. The difference is we are now going to end up in a scenario that in order for these guest VMs to work, instead of relying on centralized storage, we're going to take advantage of all that disk hardware that we have per node. We're going to focus on local storage operations in such a way that this alleviates our performance bottlenecks, but we're not going to sacrifice on resiliency or functionality. Anytime a hypervisor needs to do a storage operation on behalf of a guest, that hypervisor is going to hand off control to storage to a CVM. And that CVM for this node will handle all storage read writes to the local disk. Now, if we only had this data in one spot, this would be bad. If we had a scenario where the hard drive failed or the node failed, if moving a VM to another host resulted in that host saying, I don't know where your data is, this would not be a great solution. If that data was only one spot and could be lost due to some sort of hardware or component unavailability, that would also be a negative. So the short version of this conversation, there's a little bit more going on under the hood, is that all CVMs communicate with each other in terms of cluster operations, managing what's in the cluster and what's going on, and controlling data read writes across the storage fabric. That's going to do two things for us. Any data we write to hardware, to disk, one, is going to be efficient. Two, it's going to be resilient and fault tolerant. For example, Nutanix clusters in brief introduce a topics called redundancy factor two and three, which gives us fault tolerance one and two behavior. Short answer, if we have at three or more nodes in the cluster and we want to be fault tolerant one, then for guest data, we're going to have two replicas of any one piece of guest data. That data that's on node one is likely going to favor a local pathway. Hey, let's write here because I'm right here and this is available. But I'm also going to replicate that by allowing another that CVM to replicate that to some other CVM in the cluster where capacity is available. Anything we write is written twice. You want to go fault tolerant two, we'll throw five or more nodes in there and all this data will be written three times. Two things fail, one remaining. Fault tolerant one, we have two copies, one fails, one's remaining. As long as we're within our fault tolerance, we're never going to lose something critical that we depend on. So within this environment, the data is always resilient. Yes, we're going to favor local storage operations, but the trade-off is we don't want that as a single point of failure. All the data is always resilient within the cluster. It's written at least one other place, depending on the data that we're talking about. Two, if a CVM ends up in a scenario where it doesn't have a copy of that data, all it has to do is using that intra-cluster communication, our distributed storage fabric, ask another CVM, hey, fetch this for me. Therefore, if we engage in a scenario that while technically we're using local storage, it's distributed, any one node is going to favor storage here, replicate somewhere else, all nodes get access to data on themselves and somewhere else, but without a complicated centralized storage design. Anything we need, if I decide to migrate a VM from one host to another, whether a live or part of an HA recovery event, getting that VM on the new host is all the same experience that you expect in traditional hypervisors. That VM is going to start up, and if it's on a node where its copy of the disk is happy, we'll keep working. If it's not, if it ended up on this host who didn't have a copy, that CVM will fetch the data from another host. And then data will rebalance to go back to an optimal config. All right.
So bottom line from the hypervisor's perspective, HV, one of the three hypervisors we can run on Nutanix cluster, HV, the Acropolis hypervisor, is a hypervisor from Nutanix. It's already pretty much cluster aware. The hypervisor is going to do the virtualization. Where we start interfa interacting with cluster operations and storage, the hypervisor hands off to AOS, which is a cluster aware thing, regardless of the hypervisor or hardware that we're on. And so you've got two Nutanix components here, not just one thing. The Nutanix cluster is operated by this Acropolis operating system. And we'll just call that the CVM for the rest. So you don't have to worry about the names as much. The Acropolis hypervisor, or AHV, is the Nutanix provided hypervisor. In scenarios where you're still running with ESX or Hyper-V and moving from traditional cluster to ESX on Nutanix or Hyper-V on Nutanix, uh, well, in that case, we got ESX Hyper-V functionality on top of the distributed storage fabric. They're kind of going to work with things the way they expect, but we present the storage handoff in the way that they think it's centralized storage. But those calls for this node go to this EVM to handle within the cluster and distribute and make it redundant. Any other node hands it off. So the good news here, ESX and Hyper-V don't see a difference in their behavior. Whether you're running HV, ESX, or Hyper-V in the Nutanix cluster, our storage operations will be part of the distributed storage fabric. It will be replicated two or three times to meet our resiliencies, fault tolerance requirements. Uh, any VM that moves around the environment as a live migration, it has the ability to be on a host that already has access to a copy of that data, or that host can fetch a copy. So I can move a VM anywhere in the cluster, no loss of functionality, because even though it's not a centralized storage, the data is still available to all hosts within the cluster. If a node or a component were to fail, everywhere from disk to CVM to the entire node, well, thanks to the distributed storage fabric, everything about the cluster is resilient, no single points of failure. We have storage recovery. We have CVM operations recovery. Uh, the whole host fails. VMs can move to other nodes in the cluster. And again, because the data is still present, we can rebuild and recover. Um, we get all the functionality of your centralized storage and traditional hypervisor, but in fancy new wrapping. The final consideration of this, because it's the intro and we get to the good stuff. Um, what all this gives us is that outside of reliability, as your cluster grows from three or five or 10 or however many nodes, we don't have to worry about IOPS and performance bottlenecks at the storage level. In a three node cluster, a node's doing about a third of the operations plus replicas on behalf of about another node's worth of data. 10 node cluster, that node's doing about, again, a tenth of the storage operation, one node's worth of operations, and probably data on behalf of one or two other nodes in the cluster. The bigger your cluster gets, the more nodes you have participating in local storage operations, replicas are still redundant, and so we can scale without seeing IOPS as a performance bottleneck. The last part about this, storage is highly optimized. Anytime we're writing data, in addition to replicating it, the Nutanix, storage, uh, Nutanix cluster yeah, distributed storage fabric, or the way those words fit together, is also doing data tiering. We're combining this with a mixture of probably fast and slightly less fast disks. So you can spend your money on NVMe high performance tier and SSDs for the capacity tier. We can do SSDs and HDDs. Um, and the overall idea is anytime a guest is waiting on a performance, that's what's going to hit our hot tier, our fastest disk, and get immediately acknowledged, replicated quickly in the cluster, and acknowledged back. Guests that are not going to see any waiting. Anytime we need to do more work on the data and it's going to hit that slower disk, that's after we've moved on. So you get awesomely fast read-write performance, reliability replication, and complete data availability within the cluster. Our hypervisors don't lose anything being here, but this means the storage is able to do a couple of advanced things that provide a lot of benefits when we start doing VDI, and a lot of it. Okay, so all you need to know is that when we start talking about the Nutanix cluster generically, I'm talking about the cluster doing distributed storage fabric, probably regardless of the hypervisor. If I start using the phrase Nutanix AHV or talking about the hypervisor on the cluster, that usually means there's a very specific component we need to talk to. So if it's ever not clear, I'll try to demystify that. Okay, and that's just enough to get our feet wet. All right, so AOS, think of that as the cluster control tier, regardless of hypervisor and hardware. HV is a Nutanix specific hypervisor that has features that you'd expect an enterprise hypervisor to have, 
but we'd also be running ESX or Hyper-V on that cluster. And I'll talk about when that's relevant when we get to the next part. Okay, now for the quick Citrix intro, because I went a little longer on the Nutanix one than I meant, but we have to get those foundations down there. And I hope if you're new, that at least shows you what's a little bit different. If you take an entire Nutanix class, that's like the day one discussion. Okay, Citrix virtual apps and desktops. Now, one quick note about terminology. This is also the product line formerly known as ZenApp and Zen Desktop. Since the 7X release of the product, we've gone from the Zen Desktop 7 name to CVAD. Citrix likes to rebrand things a lot. The reason why I point this out is for two reasons. For the longest amount of time when Zen Desktop 7.0 came out, till about 7.15, 7.18, we were using a, a major version, minor version notation. Starting about November 2018, we switched to a year-month naming convention. So after about the 7.18 release, you'll start seeing numbers like 18.11, 2018 November. Right now, uh, 1912, 2019 December release. The current release is 2103, the March 2021 release. Um, just so you know where we fit in that. Anything Zen Desktop 7X to the year na month naming convention or CVAD is the same product line, though a lot of features have changed. When you look at the Nutanix documentation talking about Citrix, they acknowledge, yep, Citrix changed their names to CVAD. We're going to call it Zen Desktop throughout all of the Nutanix documentation. And they will mention versions. Some things will need to be 7.9 and later. Some things may need to be 7.13 or 7.15 and later. Some may say 19.03. If you're not fully Citrix aware, if you see a four thing, it's probably a year month release and it's all later than the 7x stuff. Hopefully that there's a note within my speaker notes if I have to give it to you later. Um, but you'll see both names in the Nutanix referencing Citrix terms. And we'll get to the rest of the stuff as we get there. So what about the Citrix architecture new, do we need to see so we can get into the technical stuff? All right. An abbreviated version of the Citrix architecture, I'm not gonna worry about databases or licensing or domain controllers, but the end result in our essential settings here, a CVAD environment consists of the controllers and the site configuration that we manage as a single entity to deliver VDAs to users. Now CVAD is a complete package, Citrix virtual apps and desktops. It allows admins to configure the environment, coordinate the delivery to users both on and off network through products called Storefront and Citrix Gateway, which we're not gonna worry about in this conversation, to build and maintain these resources that we wanna deliver. So all of our VDI, VDAs are either server, multi-user based, Windows or Linux operating systems. They're gonna be a set of operating systems with apps that users need to get access to or we're gonna go workstation based and single user and say, well, here's a individual system that I need a user to get to and for 500 users, I gotta have 500 of them. Uh, we're gonna find a way to broker this environment to those users. So at the point that we're concerned about this, we have infrastructure and these could all be physical or virtual machines, but how do I get the control tier to mass produce these VDAs for delivery given the changes in the hypervisor that we're discussing? All right, so a couple key definitions. So when we look at a CVAD, the site is that management entity. The whole thing that you manage is one thing. Take CVAD design courses and we'll take you end to end on what to do with that. It consists of one or more controllers and these are act as the brains. So you make configuration changes against them. They update the database and do the work that we need. Oh, look, you're already showing up. Okay. The management console for CVAD is Citrix Studio. For this conversation, I'm gonna assume the management console is local to the controllers to get things simple. We then have one or more hypervisors in a hypervisor cluster of your vendor of choice. And within that, we're gonna create usually virtual servers and virtual workstations for delivery. Now, depending on the exact nature, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do that's physical, that's temporary provisioned, that's persistently provisioned. Our focus for this, because we're aligning with Nutanix, is just the virtual resources, and I'm gonna limit the scope to provisioned entities. Provisioning, there's that phrase Citrix admins use a lot. Provisioning refers to the instance that if I wanna go create 20 or 200 servers of a Slimmer config, how can I do that without building 200 individual things over and over again? If I need to build 1,500 to 3,000 VDIs in a consistent configuration, how do I do that without mass building individual systems. 
So we have two technologies on the back end that we'll dig into in a moment after I get some technical details out of the way. Machine Creation Services, abbreviated MCS, and Provisioning Services, well, the old name was Provisioning Services, PVS. It's officially called Citrix Provisioning, but we're going to use the PVS nomenclature because it's short and easy to write. Both of these give us the ability to start with one base image and create dependent clones from those. PVS has some extra infrastructure to get that done. MCS can do it just with the site and the hypervisor and the storage solution. And so we're going to look at where this is. So what we need out of the infrastructure, what does it take for the CVET site can natively communicate with ESX and Hyper-V and various cloud platforms? We have a Nutanix cluster in this environment. What does it take to talk to AHV, the other hypervisor? And where's those point of intersections? OK, we'll pause there for a second. And that's what we're looking at. More on the MCS and PVS topics in a second, but that's a good ramp up. All right. So next part, integrating CVAD with Nutanix HV. So at the end of the day, what CVAD is looking for, uh, one, I need to have capabilities to power VMs on and off to meet demand. Two, if we go back to those provisioning technologies, I need the ability to, one, create a whole bunch of VMs from a given reference image to meet a certain requirement, create the disks in the way that we require to make that happen, and power those VMs on and off. So CVAD needs a way to issue commands to hypervisor to power manage VMs and create VMs and other stuff. Provisioning services, such as provisioning if in use, needs a way to issue commands to a hypervisor. And we have a couple other components that may be involved in this. So the first thing about this, when we look at the standard Citrix integration, it says, OK, you've got ESX, you've got Hyper-V, you've got the Citrix hypervisor, you've got these other cloud things. And if you're a Nutanix administrator and say, I don't see a Nutanix HV connection in there if I'm running the Acropolis hypervisor. All right, so step one, we need some plugins to extend the capabilities. So Nutanix and Citrix have worked together. Nutanix is owning these plugins. You'll get the plugins that you need from Nutanix. And there's four components typically in a CVAT environment that can run one of these two plugins to achieve communication with the hypervisor. First off, if I want a CVAD and Nutanix to play well together and take advantage of all the CVAD functionality on top of the HV hypervisor, I'm going to need some plugins. All right. So first off, where we're going to get these. All right, for those people that are new to Nutanix, Nutanix offers portal.nutanix.com, the Nutanix support portal. And from here, Nutanix admins can do case management, downloads, and documentation for all sorts of things. Uh, you can search, and if you look up Citrix, you'll probably find this easily. But just so you know where to go, in case you need other things, if we start in downloads and we start in AHV, there's a filter here or instead of the HV downloads that admins need to patch their HV to a certain version, there's a Citrix node. Otherwise, you can search for it. And underneath here, the latest version, there are two downloads and the release notes. I've also given you at the end uh, some blueprints and white papers that Nutanix and Citrix has written on both of these interactions to bridge the gap. Release notes are bare bones. You want some more documentation. But within this, we have the Nutanix HV plugin for Citrix Director. I didn't really mention Citrix Director yet. You also have a separate plugin, Nutanix HV plugin for Citrix. This plugin for Citrix Director is only needed on what we call Citrix Director, which is a monitoring tool. We'll go show you what that does in a second. The Nutanix HV plugin for Citrix is one install that can be deployed on three different components. And this is going to give us those MCS and HV connection details. All right, this is the latest versions. One's March 2021, other one's December 2020. Nutanix revs either when AOS has changed, or HV has changed, or something in Citrix has changed. So it is a good idea to probably put this on your radar. If you're not seeing those notifications in the Nutanix dashboard, uh, check back once a month and make sure nothing big has changed, that you don't need a version change because of something going on in your environment. Previous versions are listed here. OK, so those are the things. All right, so where are we going to use these? All right, back to this. All right, first off, the Nutanix plugin 
to allow us to communicate to HV, to power manage VMs and create VMs and disks to meet our requirements. If I'm gonna use Citrix Studio, I'm gonna need an HV connector to talk to HV in the cluster. If I'm gonna use provisioning services, provisioning services again also has the ability to do rapid provisioning of VMs on a given hypervisor. Citrix provisioning also has the ability to talk to ESX and Hyper-V and other things normally. It also needs a connector for HV. Now the thing is, some of the PVS capabilities are dependent on the CVAD capabilities. And so it is important if you're going to use Citrix provisioning that before you set up the connector on provisioning, you also set up the connector on Studio. These two are requirements for each other. Okay. We have one more component where the non-director plugin will be used, but that's going to require a quick intro to Citrix Cloud, so we'll come back to that in a second. The third component is Citrix Director. Now, Citrix Director is a Citrix monitoring tool. It provides session data and connection details, both real-time and historical, um, and reports a lot of information. It doesn't usually need a hypervisor connection itself, but when running on a Nutanix cluster, uh, there's some stats and metrics that are unavailable to director to draw the real-time data from if you're using HV. So the connector for Citrix director allows director to grab these IO stats on behalf of VMs to give you a more complete picture of these workloads within your monitoring tool. For studio and provisionings, this is what's allowing us to create the VMs for machine creation services processes, create the disks in a certain way power managed VMs, regardless of how they're created, if they're hosted on HV, to meet changes in demand, scale up to meet peak, shut down after hours. PVS needs those connections to do the its version of machine creation as well. And the end results will be managed by the site. So this gives you an idea of the basic tools and where we're going to use them. Okay. There's one other piece that's going to be used. If the Citrix environment is hosted as Citrix Cloud, there's a lot of varieties of that, but the short version is we have our control tier hosted as CVAT as a service in the Citrix Cloud, while the VDAs and therefore the hypervisor remains on-prem. Likely the provisioning environment is on-prem as well. In order to allow a cloud-based CVAD site to also take advantage of powering VMs on and off and creating VMs through machine creation services for the on-prem HV hypervisor, we have to provide a mechanism that allows CVAD to communicate on-prem and on-prem resource to communicate to cloud. Now, on its own, the Citrix cloud connectors are that resource. We'll have two or more to avoid single points of failure. And they're the go-between between the cloud controllers and all on-prem resources and vice versa for all sorts of communication. Communication to Active Directory, communication to our hypervisor, communication to whatever else we're doing. That's not a detailed Citrix conversation. So in this case, we also need an HV connector on cloud connectors to facilitate issuing commands to an HV hypervisor. All right, so out of those two plugins, the plugin for Citrix Director only gives director functionality for HV because it's not really managing VMs, it's doing that report metrics gathering, okay? The other download, or the, the Nutanix HV plugin for Citrix, this one during the install, We'll have a choice. Oh, you install this on uh, the, whoops, that should say controller, on the CVAD controller or on the Citrix provisioning servers or on the cloud connector, depending on details. All right. So uh, a couple of version information. I'm going to gloss over these, come back to if I need to. Um, I showed you where to get the downloads. I want to come back to that slide just for the quick screenshot since I don't have a demo environment today. I apologize. So when you down the Nutanix HV plugin for Citrix, You'll choose, is it running Zen Desktop MCS HV plugin? That's a plugin for the Zen Desktop CVAD controllers. This will allow us to do MCS creation and other power management against HV. CWA, that's uh, short for Citrix Workspace app. Again, Citrix rebrands stuff a lot. CVAD is like a subset or workspace app. This is the MCS HV plugin for the cloud connector. If you're not doing a cloud deployment, this won't be used. Okay. And the PVS HV plugin allows PVS to go to the HV environment. This plugin and to set up PVS for HV requires the controllers to be set up first. Okay. Now, once that's set up, check the release notes, 
check the Citrix documentation for this. Release notes coming from new tasks, Citrix admin. Uh, we're not going to try to cover every requirement and dependency here because, one, there's a reason why documentation exists, and there's a few considerations. You are dealing with cross-vendor integrations. Uh, after the initial install, Citrix will tell you there's a couple services on the Citrix controllers you can bounce that will make this show up uh, if you're not ready to reboot. So if it doesn't, say, Nutanix is there. So within the cluster now, this allows us to tell CVAD, hey, there is that connection to that hypervisor there. And we're going to define this thing called a host connection and tell it how to do things on AHV, the Nutanix cluster. And then when we do an MCS creation, we can use that connection to build out these VMs. Um, the question on the line, uh, why doesn't Citrix natively support AHV? I think it's just a product evolution thing. Uh, when it first started off, we said, hey, we got these hypervisors, and they never developed it. At the moment, Citrix and Nutanix are jointly working together on improving that partnership. Um, it's just product teams sometimes don't move as fast as the customer base wants them to. Um, a lot of these plugins are right now being pioneered by Nutanix. I don't know if that's going to change in the future. We would like to see it, but I'm not sure where the two companies stand on that. Bottom line, we do have a way to get there. So the overall idea at this point is that if your cluster is running on Nutanix, we're going to do the connection details. And just to summarize some information, uh, when a Citrix environment is trying to issue commands to a hypervisor, any hypervisor, we're going to tell it how to talk to that management point of that hypervisor. So typically, if we were dealing with uh, ESX here, we're say, hey, there's a vSphere address somewhere that you can use, or a vCenter address if needed. You got Hyper-V, we tell it, hey, go talk to System Center VMM and do Microsoft things on the Microsoft hypervisor. So this connector here, we're going to say, hey, go talk to HV. Well, when we talk to HV, that little cluster that we built, I want to get the storage lines out of here for half a second, maybe. You may want those again, so I'm just going to hide them real quick. Okay. When we're in this cluster, one of the ways that you can manage the cluster centrally, instead of knowing every IP address of every CVM, Nutanix clusters get assigned what's called a CVM management VIP, a virtual IP that floats. If a, one CVM goes down, another CVM can take it up. As long as the cluster is operational, we can hit the VIP to do things. So for me to issue commands to AHV, I just need this management VIP to do the job. That's my cluster management IP. Uh, so where was I here? OK. So for HV, this connector is going to say, all right, give me that Nutanix cluster VIP for management. In addition, we're going to come back to that screen in a second. I have the virtual IP. So now you know what the management IP is. And I need to give you credentials. Now, when we're on the plugin for director specifically, the Nutanix Cluster will has a default GUI-based admin account named admin. Then Nutanix cluster admins can add additional accounts that are not called admin with proper passwords or AD integrated. Um, the Nutanix director plugin cannot use the admin, literally named admin account. It needs something with cluster admin rights, but it cannot use the admin account without throwing an error. So I'm just taking note that uh, you're probably going to want account for the CVAT environment to use as part of management. OK, so I just need HV, the address, credentials. Give us a name, and we can use this. This is just a host connection. We can use this in the rest of the catalog creation steps that we're going to be doing. I'm running out of time here. Sorry, folks. Let me keep going. Uh, Jerome, that's not really what's going on. I'm just going to say it's just where the products evolved and when product people synced up on it. When you configure director, you're also going to be asked for that virtual host IP, meaning the CVM management VIP. How do I talk to HV? Username and password. OK, so depending on which plugin, which component will be the configuration, and this will pretty much work. OK. Now, I think I have one more thing about the plugins I wanted to say. I've got some details about MCS and PVS here. Uh, I'm going to gloss over those for a second, so I want to get to the good stuff. Ah, this is the part I didn't mention. So if you're running HV on Nutanix, we need a plugin to issue commands to HV. 
if you're running ESX or Hyper-V on Nutanix, from the CVAD perspective, you don't need the Acropolis hypervisor connector to issue commands to ESX and Hyper-V, whether standalone traditional deployments or on the Nutanix cluster, they can go through a regular, for the hypervisor steps, that will look like ESX and Hyper-V. Regardless, whether you have HV, ESX, or Hyper-V on a Nutanix cluster, the Nutanix cluster storage operations give us an added round of features, but we only need this connector when using HV specifically. All right. So that's one thing to kind of close the gap on. All right. Pause there for just a second. <laughs> I got 10 minutes to do the, go the gory details. All right. So the next part about this is that once we have the date, the, the, sorry, the connector set up, once we have a new TAMS cluster, your first question is, hey, is this HV based or other hypervisor? Do I need the connectors or not? The second step, when we go look at provisioning services and machine creation services, you don't have to know everything about these technologies. Machine creation services is a technology that allows us to do, again, single base image management, use one thing to create many, and single base image updates, depending on how we do it. We start with the CVAD environment. We issue commands to a hypervisor, and CVAD, for the most part, just needs CVAD and the hypervisor and a storage solution to do the delivery. No outside components outside of the hypervisor and CVAD. While normally we're looking at hypervisors with centralized storage, we're going to look at the fact, hey, if your hypervisor, whether HV, ESX, or Hyper-V is running on Nutanix, what other storage benefits do we get beyond it works? Okay. As a storage-based solution, a lot of what we do with MP uh, MCS, we're going to create VMs one of two ways, either as linked clones or full clones. Now, typical linked clone or fast clone technology has a bunch of VMs that are linked to a common base. And then we give them some sort of differencing disk mechanism. MCS splits that between machine identity and differencing disk. And when we create these differencing disks, they can either be done on a temporary basis that's discarded after use or persistent. And we have wide reams of notes about when you do one or the other and what you do for servers versus workstations. But at the end of the day for MCS, let's go to this page for a second. OK. I can create MCS images that are linked clones, one base across multiple images, and that base will be read-only, and then give each child VM a differencing disk. So these are like dependent images. And if after the initial deployment, if I were to roll out updates, I change the base, change which base they're pointing to, and I roll a change from one to the other. All right, change the base, you change the differencing disks. If we're going with linked clones, we have decisions when to make them temporary or persistent, but at the storage level, there's certain features and behaviors that we get to take advantage of. And I'll do the shortcut, and then if you want to stick around, I can answer a few more questions about it. OK. The other time that we can do this is we can also start with a base image. And MCS gives us the option to say, all right, this output will have to be a persistent machine only. It's not going to be used for temporary. But if you want to take advantage where each child system has the same common base and still does deltas, but we want to make this where it is a full clone. Each child output is a copy of the base plus the differences. Well, this type of resource, we can benefit from certain optimizations and behaviors behind the scene differently than the linked clones. So it helps understand, hey, if we're provisioning now, which one are we doing? Temporary linked clones, persistent linked clones, or persistent full clones. And we have a range of things we can show that you can benefit from. Now, most of this will occur just because of the Nutanix doing the distributed storage fabric regardless of the hypervisor in use. So we have a few more things that we can look at. Now, on the other end of that, provisioning services. Now, most of what provisioning services does is an, uh, an earlier technology before we started doing storage level provisioning. It gets you to a similar point that linked clones do, do but instead of being storage driven, basically what we call our PVS environment is our network-based disk controllers. We're splitting that the child VMs have a base disk that they're dependent on, and their deltas that we write per child, what we're going to call a write cache. The difference is the delivery of that base disk is a network-based storage I.O. operation streamed to the target systems. And the write cache will be handled here. From a PVS standpoint, a lot of what we did with PVS originally was to get around certain complexity of centralized storage. PVS typically had lower IOPS than MCS. 
PVS was addressing certain types of problems before we had a storage-based solution to do this. PVS, for the most part, has a couple of variation scenarios, but typically when used with the CVAD delivery and VDI delivery, we're always going to use it with a temporary write cache that discards between use. It's always going to be using this type of linked clone approximate, some sort of common base with lots of differencing disks after the fact. And so uh, there's going to be some different features that really kind of apply when we start looking at the PVS side of it. All right, so we can do provisioning. All right, so with that as a foundation, if I jump ahead for a second, when we look under the hood now at the distributed storage fabric, okay, Nutanix and the distributed storage fabric has very specific handling for how it deals with data on disk in addition to the replication and the data tiering for performance. Um, there's some other stuff going on that's very intelligent storage handling. And one, there's very good efficiencies in how we do with clones and snapshots. So a lot of time you say the phrase snapshots, certain hypervisor admins start panicking a little bit. Probably not going to be able to get into that right now, so I'm going to table that conversation for a second because it's not directly related to MCS and PVS. This is the one feature that uh, is going to be a little bit different. You get more benefits of HV than ESX or Hyper-V on Nutanix, depending on how you do it. But we have, basically, there's no overhead or negative performance benefit to clones or snapshots because HV and the cluster is using redirect on writes instead of copy on write mechanisms. We get a chance we'll come into that at the end. Okay, for the MCS catalog, though, the, some of the storage operate optimizations that we have, one, for storage, there's specific storage optimizations that reduce storage consumption, compression, dedupe, and erasure coding. So it'd be nice to show you when you use which features based on whether it's MCS or PVS. The second part is this technology called shadow clones. But to take advantage of the shadow clone feature, we need to not combine certain MCS features with it. And the final wrap up is similar. If we're working with PVS, what features do we end up with? All right, in case someone's leaving, I'm going to do the lecture. I'm going to kind of jump down to the, uh, the uh, final conversation about this. Shadow clones, I'm going to come back to in a second. Sorry for cutting things a little bit short here. But if we're working with certain storage optimizations, compression reduces storage through standard compression technologies. Dedupe has the ability to reduce repeated patterns. If you're dealing with either PVS temporary catalogs, okay, PVS, the base disk, and the write cache, MCS temporary, or MCS persistent, all of these in that linked clone where there's one base and one delta, then when we look at how the cluster, regardless of hypervisor, can optimize storage, these are all good workloads that can benefit from inline compression. It's less beneficial to do a deduplication process when you've already got a linked clone. I'll give you a quick example why. The 2019 webinar goes over all of this. I just want to hit the highlights in case people are bailing out a few minutes early. OK. If you go with an MCS persistent full clone image where every system has that base, then that one will benefit quite heavily from compression and deduplication because there's a lot of commonalities across images. OK. These capabilities here are because you're in a Nutanix cluster regardless of the hypervisor that you're on. And so because Nutanix allows us to optimize storage features by storage container, it's a good idea to put all your VDAs or all VDIs that share a common workload into one container. And if everything's like linked clone based, PVS, MCS, or MCS persistent linked clones, because MCS can be linked, persistent can be linked or full. Compression inline for these. Those, if you are doing full clones, go inline and dedupe. There's this third feature called erasure coding that doesn't apply to VDIs because data has to sit seven days cold, but that's a quick laundry list. And if you stick around, I got some details on that. Why do we dedupe these, but not these? Okay, and then we'll come back up to the shadow clones, which is really cool. Trying to wrap up, I'll be done in about 10 minutes if you're running late. Okay, let's go look at the MCS comparison. Linked clones versus full clones, whether these are temporary or persistent. A lot of the processes about a deduplication at the storage level is to say, hey, these little strips of data are the same as all these other strips of data in this image, and the same as all these strips of data in these other images. That way, when the Nutanix is reading them and delivering them out of cache, we can read once and serve to many, whether they're literally the same VM or just VMs that sharing commonalities or match them up by fingerprints. The second part, when we look at actually storage deduplication, this is a 
post-processing cold storage reduction. After the data is written, we can then go back and say, hey, all those things that we just wrote 20 times is actually the same thing. Let's go write it once, replicate in the cluster, and reduce all those other things to pointers. Therefore, I don't take up as much storage. When you look at that, when you've got a full clone image, and the base is repeated. Let's say the base is only about 30% of this image content, but I just made 500 VMs from the same base image and as a full clone, that means the base is over and over and over again. The deltas are probably changing and dedupe won't benefit that probably as much, but having 500 VMs coming from the same image and each one is a full copy of that base each time with the deltas on top of it, there's a lot of room to deduplicate that. If in the linked clone scenario, which is also kind of what we're doing in PVS, so not quite as directly, we've got all these maybe 500 VMs that are derived from the single base. They're pointing to it once. They each have their deltas. The nature of the linked clone technology is already kind of deduplicated. There's not really a lot of benefit because that data only appears once. So why do all the overhead of looking for fingerprints if there's not really much storage reduction that you're going to get out of it? So we can dedupe these. We don't really need to dedupe these. You never really go wrong with compression. And so if I understood I was doing about 3,000 VDIs of this and 1,500 of these, it might be worth putting in container A and B and uh, optimally configure the Nutanix storage to do what it needs. Whether you're running HV, ESX, or Hyper-V on Nutanix, this is the cluster function. It's going to do that regardless of the hypervisor. Okay. So I know we're out of time. I want to talk about shadow clones real briefly, and then if people want to stick around. Oh, and the snapshot performance question. If you can stick around, I've got an answer for that too, but it depends on how you do it. And is there a set of guidelines for when you have too many VMs hitting one link clone? Uh, yes and no, we don't have to worry about it. OK, so Josh, that question that you just asked about the too many link clones, the shadow clones are going to solve that problem for you. So I know some people are probably antsy to get out of here. Remember, it's going to be recorded, but I'm going to do the shadow clones. I want to answer this other question about the uh, snapshot performance. And then if people want to stick around, I can keep going. <laughs> but this is what I designed to fit. I, I went a little over my apologies. OK. Shadow clones. All right, I'm going to go back to a slide or two for this. This is also mentioned in the 2019. So these optimizations, if you want a full 40 minutes on it, there's another webinar I'll point you to. Um, all right, so first off, a shadow clone is different than what we talk about with clones and snapshots. Those take a little bit more technology to get into. But a shadow clone is a native feature of the Nutanix storage fabric. And again, regardless which hypervisor you're using, this happens automatically. This is actually a game changer for MCS delivery and is one of the key benefits of doing a massive MCS-based catalog delivery off of a Nutanix cluster, because this happens without you having to touch a button at all. OK, thanks, Rich. Um, so the overall idea is this. Let's go to the diagram, and then we can read that if we need to. When we're on a traditional hypervisor, this, Josh, uh, Ask the question online, do you still, uh, not that one, is there a set of guidelines for when you have too many VMs hitting one link clone? This is one of those considerations with traditional hypervisors and centralized storage that we do have to think about, not just for the link clone dependency, but in IOPS and other performance, that all of that gets kind of nicely sidestepped by Nutanix, where we don't have to worry about it. If it's IOPS related, you probably don't have to have a worry in the distributed storage fabric. Here's the basic idea. We're doing a master image MCS catalog where there's one common base across all these VMs. And let's say your catalog, aka the resource pool that we're delivering, is straddling the hypervisor host. In the traditional hypervisor, the way that we build all these out is that, well, the VMs on all these hosts all get access to that common base from centralized storage. So yes, at a certain point, at what point does fetching, the master is read only, the read writes are the differencing disk. At what point does the storage get kind of pegged from all these operations happening against one thing? Or do we put the base disk in one place and the differencing disk somewhere else? You've got some thought and planning because we can have an environment that is too big for one storage location to handle when everything happens in one place. Shadow clone is an automatic feature of the Nutanix cluster distributed storage fabric, and the idea is this. 
this only happens for MCS-based resources that are linked loan technology. It has it does not apply to PVS, and it also only applies if we're not using this one MCS feature called RAM cache with disk overflow, which I'll explain in just a second. The overall idea is this. Anytime Nutanix detects that you've got a disk that's multi-reader based, meaning it's read only and a lot of things depend on it, which happens a lot with this linked clone technology, but it could also happen with some other type of common cloned images, not just linked clones. It's gonna automatically detect that and optimize things for us. Now, in this scenario, if we didn't do anything different and we had the linked clone on node one, we do know there's a copy of that data elsewhere in the cluster. The differencing disk data is gonna be replicated to be redundant, but right now all the VMs are node one, will favor doing storage IO based on local operations so we don't have to go across the cluster. But if I now spin, spun up 30 of these VMs across the cluster and each one's on its nodes, the VMs on node two would have less efficient performance if we made this CVM, this host, fetch the data because the base disk is on physically on node one. While we don't have, we create that cross cluster networking bottleneck and storage bottleneck that we're trying to avoid. The minute you have this many VMs across the cluster, all pointing to the same base, meaning the difference in disk says, I need some base data over there. The new test cluster detects, hey, that's a read only disk that's multi reader scenario. Whether it's because of MCS or some other related technology, Nutanix is going to automatically replicate a copy of that base disk local to each host hosting the dependent child systems. This is a replica in addition to what would usually be on the back end just for fault tolerance. It says, hey, this would be way more efficient if I gave these guys local read writes to this disk instead of there. Since this is read only, it only changes the next time we make a catalog update. So during use, it's not changing at all. So we just replicate it across wherever host we need it. And so all these VMs on node two are actually get the benefit of local storage operations. So no, we should be able to scale the environment quite heavily because we don't have everything, 300, 500, 5,000, five or 10 nodes, all reading from one copy of the base disk in one place. Um, however many VMs this host is handling, its local storage should be able to keep track of and the related replications is needed, but this will scan out, uh, scale out. That shadow clone, it basically detects, oh, I should replicate a local copy because this being local and a duplicate would be way more efficient than reading cross cluster for everything. And you get that automatically. So Josh, that should answer the question of why we should avoid a linked clone bottleneck on the base disk. Okay, so RAM cache with disk overflow. We'll try to get to a good point. So there's one more feature that first came out with provisioning services that dealt with this. Remember, traditional storage, centralized, IOPS, bottlenecks, oh my, <laughs> was our refrain for really big environment deliveries over and over again. The basic idea is that when we first started with provisioning services, it said, okay, we're gonna split operations between how much can we do from the network for the base disk delivered to the clients? And then what do they need read write is going to be in this write cache and depending on where we place it, it could be disk only, it could be memory only, it could be server side. And we're, we could maybe change if we went disk based, it would be IOPS based, you know, times 500 VMs, but we could maybe specialize where we put it. And so a lot of PVS was about reducing this. So PVS already eliminates a lot of our IOPS for the base disk because one, they read the disks for however many servers we have, they then cache it. So most of that is network-based delivery. Very little is IOPS-based on the base disk. So shadow clones don't really apply to PVS-based images. But the other way we said, hey, you know what? Trying to do all this on disk operation on the right cache was still breaking certain size environments. We still had a lot of complications. So one of the technologies PVS came up with was that what if we split the cache operations between memory and disk? We went memory only, but you gave it too little, it would stop running. If you over allocate your RAM, that gets expensive if you're not going to use it. And with modern operating systems, we kind of need a lot of RAM. If we use what's called RAM cache with disk overflow, this was one of the big game changing PVS design architects for centralized storage because it drastically reduced the IOPS. We'd go from, depending on the workload for a workstation, from 30 to 80 IOPS per user down to one to three IO operations per user, maybe eight IO operations per user. 
Well, you can do way more things if you reduce it by that type of factor <laughs> significantly. Whether server workstations, the math changes quite a bit. So we split this between RAM. The nice thing about this, we didn't have to allocate that much additional RAM for this to work. And we once you ran out of RAM, it would spill over to disk. But that means you don't really have the same IO operations per second. Just if something's not in RAM, we get it from disk. We just get it less often. That dropped the IOPS way down. When MCS first came out, it was pure storage. Everything we did in MCS was base disk, read write was IO intensive times however many VMs. Differencing this was all IOPS intensive based on how many VMs. And so we'd have to do, we'll put basis here and differencing this here and centralized storage is about IOPS and IOPS and IOPS and how to avoid those bottlenecks. Now we just so, so saw how that with um, the storage fabric, the shadow clones alleviate a lot of the duplicate reads from this guy. We have some other storage operations. But we then, to solve some MCS problems before Nutanix was a thing, if we were on any other hypervisor on traditional storage, the standard Citrix architect refrain is use RAM cache with disk overflow on the MCS feature that sometimes just referred to as MCSIO. And the idea was in the old days, we did reduce IOPS significantly on PVS. When we were then looking at MCS on centralized storage, hypervisors say, okay, this is all IOPS based. Anything we can do to release it, uh, reduce it is going to make our lives better. We now have RAM cache with disk overflow for MCS as well. Do that instead. And so for our standard designs, if you're on a non-Nutanix cluster implementation, traditional centralized storage considerations, we're going to beat, customers have said, if this is a temporary linked clone catalog in MCS, do this, do this, do this, do this. RAM cache with disk overflows doesn't apply to persistent, doesn't work with based uh, the full disk. So there's only one scenario where we can use this. When you move your uh, MCS catalog to a Nutanix cluster, don't do RAM cache with disk overflow. The RAM cache with disk overflow is going to interfere with the other storage optimizations we have. One, because it changes what a disk operation looks like. Now it's memory and disk on the Differencing disk, this actually does prevent how shadow clones work. Um, and it's kind of weird because of the way the caching mechanism changes how we, and the differencing disk is created differently than the raw linked clone is. The shadow clone just can't be generated in that scenario. So even if you got, while well, RAM cache with disk overflow was originally meant to save a lot of IOPS performance on the differencing disk, you get more benefit from MCS on Nutanix, from the shadow clones doing this. And the fact is, for all those differencing disk read writes, we're not as concerned about IOPS in general with MCS. So why do I need an IOPS killing solution if IOPS aren't the problem? Bottom line, turning the RAM cache with disk overflow on for an MCS linked clone catalog prevents some of the biggest benefits of the storage performance Nutanix can give to that MCS catalog. Shadow clones and the other things where we don't need to worry about IOPS, so you're better off without it. If you're on another hypervisor where IOPS are a concern, yes, let's, uh, another deployment, let's do that. But whether you're running ESX, Hyper-V, or HV on Nutanix, shadow clones plus the native local distribution is probably going to come out better ahead than the RAM cache with disk overflow feature would give you. So this is the one time that we circumvent our standard CVAD recommendation. OK? So let's see if I got a thing up there, and then we'll see where you guys want me to keep going or not. Uh, so shadow clones, as a summary, applies to linked clones only, MCS temporary, and MCS persistent of linked clones. If you do an MCS persistent full clone, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to PVS-based catalogs. Um, don't enable RAM cache with disk overflow, and otherwise, all of our other normal features under the hood for data locality and shadow clone tech will already be reducing bandwidth. So I don't need an IOPS killing structure if I lose some other IOPS killing uh, intra-cluster communication performance benefits. Okay. Hey, 40 of you are still here. I did lose a few. Okay. Let's see what slides I had up. 
Um, so I had a couple things. There's uh, some details of clones and snapshots. I probably have gone over what's going to reasonably fit, so I'm going to make sure I get all the questions answered. If you guys do see something you want me to jump back to, I will. And apologies for not cutting the time down more efficiently than that. Um, shadow clones happen automatically for scenarios where it makes sense. You can strategize the optimizations. Hopefully, we give you a little bit more guidelines. And for those three core topics, shadow clones and optimizations, we got a second webinar to help out with this. For those of you that are Nutanix admins and need Citrix training, admin, advanced, provisioning services specific or design, depending on what needs, you can always ask layer eight. If you're a Citrix admin wanting to go to Nutanix training, it's there. I do have a reference list. And just in case people need it, I want to come back to these questions real quick. If you give me a second, I'll dump them in the chat window, or you can always email me, uh, Rhonda at layer8training.com. I'm going to come back to one of these screens here and get through these questions, but um, I've got several things I could have done. I just didn't quite get there. OK. <laughs> Todd stayed so he could see, ask me questions. All right, if you guys want to stick around, I will keep going. But I want to try to wrap up some questions first. All right, so first question, why doesn't Citrix natively, and I'll go put these back in the log as soon as I can. Why doesn't Citrix natively support HV? I think we, I, why do product vendors do anything? They are in a partnership working together for this, but I would hope that at some point in time, we can make the plug-in discussion a little less necessity, but at the moment, this is where we're at. But Nutanix and Citrix are actively involved in improving that. Um, do you still gain snapshot performance benefits if you use ESX? OK, that one's going to take a second, Josh. So I'm going to come back to it if you're still there. Is there a set of guidelines for when you have too many VMs hitting the one linked clone? That was the shadow clone should alleviate that. Um, why And the why does RAM cache break it? If you increase the RAM to the point where it doesn't write to the differencing disk at all, does that remove that issue? Hmm, that's getting to a CVAD question, so Mike, give me one second. Those are two really good questions that a CVAD engineer can answer. Give me just a second, I'll give you some numbers on that. Um, Jerome and Todd are happy. Will there be a recording bell? Yes, we have been recording this, and it will record until I stop, and that will be posted. So if you only hear for the hour content, the extended version will be online. Uh, yes, it will be available, and I think Rich said, uh, one, they'll email it out, but it's also on our website. And um, just so you guys can find it, that was embarrassing with the recording. Um, it'll probably post next week, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, if you go under resources and then webinars and videos on the Larry website. OK, that's today. It's not posted yet. The past recordings are listed. And in fact, this one was the 2019 one, which goes deeper into all the optimization stuff, which is probably a good companion. I wasn't sure if I was going to get it all to fit or not, so I planned ahead. So this will be the page where that will be located. I'll try to put that out in the final summary. OK, the plugin isn't that big a deal, honestly, other than to remember to use it. Correct. I mean, the plugin is only needed directly during a catalog creation. As long as the cluster then knows how to reach AHV, power management should occur. OK, so we had two outstanding questions. Uh, one is about snapshot performance benefits, and the other one is about RAM cache with disk overflow. So one's a Nutanix conversation, and one is a uh, CVAG conversation. Let's start with the RAM cache with disk overflow. If anyone has anything else, please feel free to let me know. And I'm just making sure I'm not missing any questions yet. Oh, and at least one person saying they're actively doing uh, MCS right now and they love it. Yeah, here's one quick takeaway I do want to mention. Nutanix storage technology makes MCS better. Nutanix storage technology doesn't necessarily have as many added benefits on top of PVS. It just doesn't interfere with things that PVS is doing. So if PVS is your technology and you've got a Nutanix cluster, you're not quite, quite getting the add add on both sides, but it's not breaking PVS. And there are a few small gains with PVS under the hood, but PVS isn't purely storage based. So it doesn't get the same boost that MCS does, but it does make MCS way easier to deal with than traditional storage designs. OK, so that's probably a good takeaway for that. All right, so that RAM cache with Cisco overflow question. Ooh, you guys are going to make me think. Um, all right, let's go back to RAM cache with Cisco overflow. 
uh, when, uh, whether PVS or MCS, so I've got a little bit more room, I'll whiteboard up here, the features were the same. There is a Zen Desktop Design Handbook that quotes all these numbers. I can do most of the IOPS tables off the top of my head, but here's the deal. We originally had a version of this. We had the disk only caches, which were great, but IOPS were your only result. Um, we had a RAM only cache, but then everything you did in the differencing disk on the VM had to fit in RAM. And if you ran out of RAM, you'd essentially blue screen. Well, back when we were all virtualizing Windows 95 and XP, I could probably run the operating system apps with two gig. And if I threw a half a gig or another gig at it, we'd be okay. Things like, well, don't get me started on servers, but Windows 7, 8, 10, they need one to two gigs just to sit there, look pretty, doing nothing, let alone trying to run Office. So in order to take up what might be, even if it's a temporary desktop that rolls out at the end of the day, to allow a user to get five or eight gigs or more of changes without running a RAM, the cost in RAM, instead of creating like, if we're talking about a workstation, instead of doing like a four CPU, um, four gigs of RAM config on that VM times 500 VMs, especially on a hypervisor that's doing fixed RAM allocation, to now have to say, oh, we have to give 12 to 16 gigs of RAM for every workstation. Uh, that's an extraordinary outlay of cost in RAM in terms of hypervisors, just to avoid running out of RAM there. And that's why the RAM only cache never really worked. It was cost prohibitive once we started having adult operating systems and not Windows 95 that only need, do you remember the Windows 95 specs only need like 256 meg of RAM? Actually it needs 64 meg, it could work at 256. We started throwing two and four gigs at Windows 95 and XP, it's going like, yay. We don't miss those days, right? Um, those were easy to solve. Bigger operating systems, RAM was just cost prohibitive to do well. The RAM cache with disk overflow, here's the trick. Um, I'm going to qu quote the workstation numbers. If we looked at just a regular disk only VM, it doesn't even have to be a provision, just a normal IOPS from light to heavy. On a workstation, you'd have anywhere like maybe 10 IO operations per second per user workstation instance, up to closer to 30 IO operations per second, depending on how heavy or even higher. I'm doing some of this has been a six months since I last look at the table. If we drop that down with the RAM cache with disk overflow, we're getting some of these resources, depending on how high they are and whether we're talking servers or workstations, we're dropping those numbers down into maybe three IO operations per second per session, uh, maybe as high as eight, depending on if we're doing graphics card and really intensive stuff. Back when storage mattered, that was a really big deal and that was a huge significant times 500 VMs or however uh, 500 users we had, that would be a lot. You get even further reduction on the server side uh, when we go forward, just to give you a sense of scale. And the trick is I didn't need to throw tons of RAM at it. If my normal workstation only needed four CPU and four gigs of RAM, typically I needed to plan for the space. Do I need 10 or 15 gigs of the cache digs? 20 gigs, it's then allocated so it still only grows needed. But for a, a relatively cheap outlay in potential storage, I might only need on a workstation, depending on how heavy they are, anywhere from 256 meg to maybe one and a half gigs of additional RAM for the RAM cache feature. If I've got a truly heavy workload, we might do a gig or a gig and a half of RAM. If it's less than that, I only need 256 or 512. Now, any memory we allocate to the RAM cache feature was memory the operating system didn't have for operating system and apps. But for workstations, if we were giving that user four gigs of RAM as a standard config anyway, or even just two CPU or whatever, and say, well, I'm going to give it 256 meg or half a gig of RAM, I may not even need to increase the RAM per VM for a little bit of storage cost to reduce the IOPS by up to a third, if not 60%. So the idea was I didn't have to compensate in RAM drastically to see these performance benefits. So for traditional storage, yay, do this all the time. Um, for servers, the numbers even went down even more because you had less IOPS per user anyway. Um, if I had to throw RAM, at, let's say that we had a really heavy intense resource and I needed a gig of RAM to do the RAM cache for disk overflow. Okay, I might go from making 500 VMs at four gigs of RAM to 500 VMs at five or six gigs of RAM. If it solved the performance, it may be worth it. 
but I didn't need to overcompensate for it. So in that particular situation, when you asked, uh, well, if we throw more RAM at it, does it alleviate the problem of IOPS? Well, if we're on centralized storage, I care. If I'm on the distributed storage fabric, I don't care that it's storage-based. Not as much. IOPS aren't the problem. I just need to have capacity for the redundancy, and it does that really well. So instead of trying to finagle the numbers and give up the performance benefits that we're already giving from shadow clones, that's what we say on the Nutanix cluster, just don't do this and let the shadow clone and the normal storage optimizations take in because we're not going to have an IOPS bottleneck. So why throw RAM at the problem to alleviate an IOPS bottleneck that we don't have? If we're centralized storage, you probably can't throw enough RAM at it to make it cost effective, but splitting between these two does work. Does that answer that question for the one who asked about the RAM cache feature? Disk latency, that seems to be the bigger issue rather than IOPS. Uh, Mike, are you talking about in your cluster or are you just talking about on traditional storage? Ooh, in the cluster. Yeah, the disk read writes should not have those same bottlenecks, but I may have a reference that you can look at after the fact. Uh, the normal data tearing, and no, I'm not gonna have a data tearing lecture should usually result in all the data going to the disk is going to the fast storage that we're immediately waiting on and replicating. So the two things that are dependent that your fast data is meeting your capacity speeds. It's possible that if you're doing SSDs that going to NVMe might help, but there also might be, there are some Nutanix documents on scaling the cluster to make sure you're not putting too much onto one node for other performance reasons. The other part is anytime we write the data to the hot tier, it also has to replicate around the cluster. Therefore, your intra-cluster communication between CVMs cannot be a bottleneck. You definitely need that to be 10 gigs or better. There's some benchmarking we can do. But also, the I don't have the diagram handy, the network architecture should have a linear scale between nodes in the cluster and not like three-tier architecture bottlenecks. If some nodes are higher cost away than others, then the cost of waiting on that replica is going to translate here. I would definitely say if it's a storage disk latency, it might be we do have to distribute across multiple nodes. So I'll try to dig up the one Nutanix article that talked about performance in depth that may help you out with that. It was probably, but stick around and I'll see if I can find that before we wrap up. It hardly hits the right cache limit. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna come back to that snapshot in a question. Oh, you can't go to NVMe. You might need to distribute the workloads a little bit, or there might be something that we're not doing the way that we should. So you might have to get either a Citrix or a Nutanix expert to look at the cause of the bottleneck, because, but I'll see what I can find for you, Mike. Um, the second conversation Josh asked, and I'll get back to the snapshot. Citrix recommends MCS cache disk be the same size as the OS image. Um, but we find it hardly hits the right cache limit. Well, here's the problem. Even if I allocate the differencing disk, let's say at 20 gigs, the point is if you make it five gigs and you run out, we have a problem. So if we're talking about, you said HSD, so hosted server desktop, servers have way more users per server and go a longer time between reboots where the temporary disk gets discarded than the workstation does. Um, because we have to wait for a reboot. That's either gonna be nightly or weekly, but you could have a lot of users going out. So it's gonna change more. If we gave it only a 10 gig disk and you run out of space, just like a regular server running on hard drive space, it's just gonna crash at the end <laughs> and not work. So you wanna give it more space. Since usually these differencing disks, especially the temporary ones, are thin allocated and only grow as needed, it shouldn't matter if we declare it a 50 or 100 gig space if we're probably not gonna get there. You could size it based on what you observe, um, that safety to match the original disk config is just to make sure if the system thinks it can grow to 50 gigs and you do something that says 50 gigs but it only has 20, you're going to have a, a, a storage uh, collapse. Uh, the VM is going to stop working, just like if you give it too little space and it can't grow anymore. So I, unless we, we've got a concern with fragmentation, it, it, but because Nutanix is moving data across the storage all the time, fragmentation isn't a problem. So I just then allocate it and I wouldn't worry about the number. Todd shared some information, uh, Mike uh, I, or Josh, about the um, performance with the inter-cluster switch communication. 
And if you get time, I'll open up the diagram. That intra cluster, whether it's 10 gigs or better, also leaf spine or other architectures that scale linearly. But yeah, if the storage is a bottleneck, it's going to, sorry, if the network between nodes is a bottleneck, it's going to look like a storage delay. Okay. So I think someone else is still there. A couple of people had to leave. There was a question on the snapshot. And then if anyone else needs me, let me know. Let me see how many people stuck around. Oh, 32. Great. Anyone else got some questions? Let me know. If there's hands raised, I don't see those, but I got the questions there. All right. And they're going faster than I can keep up with them. Okay, great, you guys. I appreciate your patience and thanks for sticking around. It's not like you have to go back to work, right? Where's that snapshot question? Do you still gain snapshot performance benefits if you use ESX? I actually had a slide on this. And uh, okay. It depends on how you do it. Now, the short answer with the redirector on writes versus the other stuff is that, and I wish I had my cluster from yesterday's class ready to go to answer this. Uh, when you're in a Nutanix cluster, if you're running HV, there's two places that you can do to do snapshot management. I can go straight to the VM and create snapshots ad hoc, or I can go to an entity called a protection domain and use that to manage snapshots across multiple VMs. Okay, in HV, it doesn't matter whether you go to VM or to the protection domain. HV is basically Nutanix distributed storage fabric aware. Snapshots made by HV at the VM level is still going to be this redirect on write mechanism, and snapshots made by the protection domains are too. Now, when we have ESX or Hyper V on the cluster, my, I was trying to get a definitive answer on this. So I'm going to say, put a note, Rhonda might be slightly wrong, but my understanding of everything I was reading beforehand, because I wanted to get an answer to this too. If you go to the VM and you say, take snapshot, you're asking the hypervisor to do it, which now means ESX is in control using its mechanism, which is going to be the disk chaining mechanism. If anyone wants to see a, a depiction, I'll show you in a second. If I go to the protection domain and let basically the cluster do it, now AOS and distributed storage fabric are in charge. My understanding is that uh, one, because it said, hey, if you have both VM level snapshots and protection domains for ESX images, there's going to be a conflict. Um, use the protection domain, which is also part of one, let's have a group of entities that we snapshot on a schedule and can then easily roll back as a group or individually and that we can replicate to our asynchronous or other locations for disaster recovery. So if you do it through the protection domain, it's more of a cluster operation, and that should still get you all those benefits. All right, um, so when we think about a snapshot, uh, for MCS for a second, I actually brought this in so I could do this. You know, a lot of with MCS, we have the original read-writable disk, we then use that as a base. We make a snapshot with a disk level point in time capture. You then have the new read writable location. We make the foundation of that disk, the foundation for the MCS catalog. And then the next time we want to roll an update, you know, you make a new snapshot, you got a new point in time capture, you got a new read writable location. This is read only. But as a result, when we're looking at snapshots and similar mechanism with clones on traditional uh, copy on write uh, or storage level snapshots. We have to resolve this data by saying, okay, to this date is made of the new stuff I've done now and the old stuff I did here and the old stuff I did here. Over time, as the snapshots get longer or when you clone a lot of systems, one, it takes more and more time to resolve those. Two, for ESX specifically, there are situations that when you actually go to generate snapshots for like a large number of systems, it can impact storage operations of the ESX environment traditionally causing these performance bottlenecks, which is why ESX is like, don't snapshot, don't do this other stuff, kind of reduce it, uh, be nervous, and be careful. And when you go to delete and we have to re-resolve them, there's kind of a problem. Uh, this information here, our diagram specifically, uh, this one diagram is in the courseware, but the rest of this is in a section of the Nutanix Bible. If you look up the NutanixBible.com, it's a supplemental resource to the official Nutanix documentation, but really good at concepts. Uh, look up the phrase snapshots and clones. It's like the second phrase of that. Maybe you leave an S off and you'll get there. Uh, and you'll see this discussion about this. What Nutanix does, remember snapshots and clones are 
similarly related processes. There's a clone section and there's a snapshot section. Anytime HV or the cluster is doing storage, they call these VM level snapshots, not storage level snapshots. Uh, they're using a redirect on write mechanism. So let's say this is a snapshot. We're pointing to the little strips of data extents. Instead of doing this in a way that when you make your new disk or snapshot, uh, this is the, the new read writable, instead of pointing back to the base like a disk chain and saying, here's your data and here's my new stuff, each of these child systems here, Snapshots and clones do something similar. Instead of what we do say, hey, that base disk at this date was pointing to these components. When we make a snapshot, we say, hey, you, you get the same pointer map it had. One, the cost of creating this by giving it a duplicate set of pointers is fast and doesn't matter how many snapshots we take at once. There is no negative storage impact. Two, when we then start making changes, all right. Well, this was the base, and that snapshot's fixed. It's pointing to these pointers. These pointers, these extents, the strips of data are read-only. This just says, oh, I need to do something that's no longer D1. Uh, I just need to drop this pointer to this read-only block, and I got a new pointer here. So now I'm at my new state, new stuff plus old stuff that didn't change. So the longer the snapshot gets, every time you make a snapshot, it's just, OK, whatever pointer map we had before, you get your own copy. If I start deleting snapshots, this guy doesn't care. As long as there's a pointer to the data, we don't need to delete it, and it doesn't cost hardly any overhead to figure these out or generate them new. So this is where the benefit of redirect on write is. Um, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing five or 500 VM snapshots. Um, it doesn't matter whether I've got one or a 20 chain. Uh, the 20th one knows where all its data is. I'm not going to delete anything until there's no more dependencies on it. Cloning is a very similar mechanism, and clones are also get their own pointer maps. And so this would work more when cloning images. This is not the same thing as the shadow clone, and it's not the same thing as our link clone technologies. But you start with a base image, you say, I want to go create 10 VMs from that, a normal sysprep process or something like that. You got your base image that points to this. That base is kind of now read only. Each clone gets a pointer map, and we can create as many of these clones as we want. Their data is read writable. They get the pointer here, and they have a new set of pointer places that they can use. So anything that changes for this guy, he's got the non-changing pointers in his new stuff. This one has a different set of the old, original pointers in the new stuff. So these are very easy to manage. So that's just kind of why redirect on write is more efficient. And so when we look at that, um, I know I put it in my speaker notes for the slide. I just didn't have enough room to squeeze it on the slide. For HV, whether you create snapshots of the VM as a hypervisor performance or at the cluster level production domain, you're always going to do redirect and writes. My understanding is for ESX or Hyper-V, if you go to the VM and do it, it's now the hypervisor control, which may be whatever they're doing. But if you do it through the protection domain, the, the cluster does it. So you'll get redirect and write if you do it through a protection domain. OK, does that make sense? A lot of people had to drop off. OK. Um, I think I caught all the questions that hit the chat. I'll try to go write a summary so those get logged. I was talking my way through it. Uh, does anyone have a question you'd like? And I went way over. So I warned Rich. He was only giving me an hour. Um, and because I didn't have to go back and teach a class, I kind of over-prepared for this. Any other questions or anyone have anything you'd like to ask? All right. So for additional information on optimizations, dedupe, compression, and the other stuff, I'll make sure you guys know where the first webinar is. Um, this one hopefully gave you a little bit more on CVAD specific details. And I don't know if we're going to have a way to get the slides with speaker notes out to you guys, but the webinar is there. And I'll uh, let me see if I can throw those. Um, let me see if my chat window gets all of you. And I'll at least dump in the uh, resource list for you. There's two, so if you're still on the meeting, you will get that copy. One moment here. All right, this is not all the resources, but for the CVAD integration today, try this. And the things that we used for the previous class, I did that in the chat. Let me know if you actually saw those. This resource list if you want screenshots. Oh, good. For the 2019 presentation, whoops.
these references, though some links might not be fully available, I'll dump these into the chat window as well, just so you don't have to go dig them up or try to screen scrape the video. We'll look to see if I had any other references I called out. Um, just in case these weren't in the first list, here's the Citrix references. One more in the chat. Okay. So last thing, if you stuck around this long, um, you can always reach out to Layer 8, info at layer8training.com. And if it's trying to get to me, that will get, they will forward it to me if it's a technical question. You can reach me at roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, layer8training.com, or Rhonda, layer8training.com. And, if you're curious about class offerings, um, obviously there's a deep dive of all sorts of Nutanix clusters in the admin class. Nutanix has more training. Um, and then on the CVAD side, admin, advanced, provisioning, assessment, so, uh, design. All right. We are officially done with what I think I can make fit. If you have any other questions, I'll stick around and we're going to have the extended webinar online for people who couldn't complete the end.